Certain derogation of certain responsibilities on, on these issues can be uh, can occur when a state invokes Article 4 of the national emergency. First of all, I'll talk more about it, but first of all, by the terms of that, I'll talk in a moment of why this is completely inapplicable to crimes against humanity and criminal cases like this. But even by the terms of that, <coughs> The covenant requires that the state officially declare a state of emergency. Nowhere in the 550 pages of Nunchia's brief do they ever even claim that the DK officially declared a state of emergency. The general comment to that convention says in paragraph, general comment 29, paragraph 2, before a state moves to invoke Article 4, the state must have officially proclaimed a state of emergency. The latter requirement is essential for the maintenance of the principles of legality and rule of time, a rule of law, at times when they are needed most. This is important, very important. National emergencies is the time when law is most needed. When you want to control the state from abusing citizens, overstepping its bounds. Some of the cases that the Minchia team cites have nothing to do, of course, with killing people, executing people without any judicial process. The kind of derogation when a state of emergency is officially declared are things like they cite the case in the European Court of Human Rights versus Turkey. In that case, the, the court, the European Court, accepted the Turkish government's argument that the PKK, the PKK terrorist activity in Southeast Turkey had undoubtedly created in that region a, quote, public emergency threatening the life of the nation. They accepted that. And the court still found, in that case, the Turkish government wanted to hold suspect 14 suspects for 14 days before they saw a judge, before judicial intervention. The court ruled that that was not permitted. In the case of Nuri Sen, the same ruling when there was an 11-day detention without seeing a judge, without any judicial intervention. Your Honor, the, the laws that we are applying here, crimes against humanity and the laws of armed conflict, they apply in, in armed conflict. They apply at times when there is a real national emergency. Uh, it, would, it would defeat the very purpose of the laws of armed conflict to say that Law is suspended during an armed conflict. Just the opposite is true. Your Honor, the General Comment 29 goes on to say in paragraph 11, state parties, and this is why I want to point out to you that this convention can never be applied in a case like this. In a criminal case, you cannot apply it. It's not meant to be applied. Paragraph 11 says state parties may in no circumstances invoke Article 4 of the Covenant as justification for acting in violation of humanitarian law or peremptory norms of international law. For instance, by imposing collective punishments through arbitrary deprivations of liberty. An arbitrary de deprivation of liberty is arresting someone with no judicial process. Exactly what occurred at each of the security centers in this case. And then it goes on to say, or by deviating from fundamental principles of fair trial, including the presumption of innocence, which of course we know there was no presumption of innocence, and there was no trial 
ហើយលើកយកត្រាប៉ូនមកជាសម្ភារថាគេ Your Honours, the Geneva Convention, DL, uh, particularly common Article 3 of those Geneva Conventions, have been described in the international jurisprudence, such as the Celebici Appeal Chamber of Judgment, as the absolute minimum standards under customary international law that apply to all conflicts, internal or international. They called it a minimum yardstick, which reflects elementary considerations of humanity. And what does Article, Common Article 3 say? Common Article 3, common to all of the Geneva Conventions. It says, to this end, the following acts are and shall remain prohibited at any time and in any place whatsoever with respect to persons taking yeah. no active part in the hostility, hostilities, including members of armed forces who have laid down their arms in those places or to combat by sickness, wounds, detention. First, a violence to life and person. In particular, murder of all kinds, mutilation, cruel treatment, and torture. And then skipping the paragraph D, remember this applies to even soldiers in detention. The passing of sentences and the carrying out of executions without previous judgment announced by a regularly constituted court, according all the judicial guarantees which are recognized as indispensable by civilized peoples. Again, we know there were no judgments, no courts, no process in any of the detention centers, the execution sites in the DK regime. A couple, another case cited in the Nunchea brief is a, another European court of human rights case, Ilashu. And in that case, the court reiterated that Quote, even in the most difficult circumstances, such as the fight against terrorism and organized crime, the Convention, and there we're talking about the European Convention of Human Rights, prohibits in absolute terms torture and inhumane or degrading treatment. It said that no derogation from it is permissible even in the event of a public emergency threatening the life of the nation. Now, Your Honours, it's not surprising if there was opposition to the DK regime. It was a regime that had impoverished its people. People were starving. People were enslaved, working in horrible conditions. And the regime we acknowledged was wildly unpopular. No one had chosen that regime. It had come to power through armed force and deception. Pretending that it was uh, that King Sihanouk was at the front, and the CPK uh, intended always to sideline Sihanouk. Your Honor, the fact that unpopular dictatorships may be unpopular, dictatorships that allow no elections, 
doesn't mean that they're free to kill their opponents with no legal process just so that they can remain in power. There clearly was some resistance to the DK regime. We absolutely acknowledge that. That's been in the evidence. So we had, for example, the, for example, the Cham in Krach Chamar, uh, Kopal, who took up swords and knives fighting against guns and heavy weapons for the religion. They resisted the regime. Long Sat was an East Zone cadre. I don't know if you remember him. I think he said he was head of the medical unit. And after all of his commanders were called to a meeting on the 25th of May, slaughtered by Cape Hawk forces, he took to the forest with a group of people to resist, to stay alive, the main reason to resist what he called the Pol Pot coup. Uh, and there are other examples. For example, uh, <coughs> Michael Vickery, in his book, is an author of the defense, likes to quote a lot. Uh, he talks about a revolt in Chikrang district in Sector 106, which revolted in April 1977 after a rumor spread that Sihanouk was about to return and the regime was about to fall. In response to that revolt, according to Vickery, the Khmer Rouge killed 8 to 10,000 people. And he also um, talked about my a Koi Koi village, village, which is an ethnic minority uh, that he said revolted, and the entire population of 700 was killed. And there certainly were other individuals <coughs> who resisted the Khmer Rouge regime. But in talking about these people and in talking about S21 in the beginning of their brief, the, uh, Nunchia quotes from Chandler. Chandler, of course, is the person who came up with talking about the Manichaean, Manichaean narrative that he said was a convenient, uh, sometimes conveniently merged what the Khmer Rouge wanted people to believe with what the Vietnamese wanted them to believe. But he said this about the, the uh, S-21. I think it's very interesting. Chandler said, using the words guilty or innocent to describe the prisoners at S-21 is misleading. Using these words lends judicial legitimacy to a macabre project whereby all the prisoners, regardless of their actions and before they started talking, were condemned to death. I'm going to finish after I read this quote for the day, Mr. President, just another minute. Chandler said, procedures followed at S-21 indeed sometimes seem to have been inspired by the Red Queen in Alice in Wonderland or by Kafka's The Trial. At another level, those prisoners genuinely guilty of opposing DK might well deserve to be seen in hindsight as heroes, while those victims who were innocent of opposition and thus sometimes complicit in the regime's guiding ideas and practices should not necessarily be honored as law-abiding citizens of a humane regime swept up in error by a responsive judicial system. But evidence shows resistance, even dissent, was very limited because of the terror imposed by the regime. Like ຂອງປະກາດຄະອະພິຈາລະການສັກມະນາການສໍາລັບ <laughs> ໄຂ່ພິຖາໃດດາວເລືອດລໍາລົມສົນສົນປີສາສົນປີໄດ້ນັ້ນຖືໂຕຕີທະນາທານຕອບໂດຍສະປຣິຍາໃນເປປຶ
Sumjeng Krokso.